Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Israel Maimon. I'm the president and CEO of Israel Bonds. Welcome to the Global Israel Bonds Ceremony for the Remembrance Day of Yom HaShoah. Thank you all for joining. Today, a delegation from Israel Bonds was scheduled to participate in the March of the Living from Auschwitz to Birkenau. From Poland, we were supposed to continue to our homeland, the State of Israel. Of course, because of the pandemic, <clears throat> we, like so many others, had to cancel this voyage. The delegation's theme was Ledov Vador, from generation to generation. And we choose a sentence from the Bible to go along this theme. The sentence is from Tehilim Terek Ein Chet Pasuk Vav. Leman Yedu Dora Haron, Banimi Valedu, Yakumu Visapuli Vnehem. That the generation to come might know, even the children who should be born, who should arise and tell their children. From Psalm chapter 78, verse 6. This is our obligation to our sisters and brothers that we lost in the Holocaust. We'll never forget, and we say, never again. I turn the program now to Bill Fox. Bill is a member of Israel Bonds Board. Bill. Thank you, Israel. Again, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining together with us on this solemn day of remembrance. I am truly honored to be your host for today's program. Participants on today's call represent a global audience located in cities across three continents joining together to commemorate the tragedy of the Shoah. Remember the six million lives lost and pay tribute to the men and women who endured and survived the worst catastrophe in human history. Yom HaShoah was established in Israel in 1959 by law. It falls on the 27th day of the Jewish, Jewish month of Nisan, a date chosen because it is the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. To begin our program, I'd like to call upon David Halpern, son of survivors, the second of four generations of Israel Bonds leaders, and a member of Israel Bonds International. <coughs> Board. David is chairman of today's event and was supposed to chair our Corona Cancel delegation to Poland and Israel. I now turn the proceedings over to David. Thank you, Bill. Good afternoon. Welcome to all of you who are with us today, including the 60 members of the Israel Bonds delegation who expected to be standing today in Auschwitz in commemoration of Yom HaShoah. We planned on this date to join the thousands of participants, young and old, from the March of the Living. We expected to hear emotional speeches from leaders of the Jewish world. We were supposed to be guided through Auschwitz and see the huge piles of hair, of shoes, and of eyeglasses taken from the pitiful Jewish prisoners before they entered the gas chambers. The pile of suitcases with Jewish names painted on them, indicating that the Jews who packed them had a glimmer of hope that they would unpack them after being, quote, resettled. Their hopes were shattered when they were shoved into cattle cars without room to move, without food or water, without bathroom facilities and little air to breathe. After days of indescribable misery, they arrived at Auschwitz, the flagship of Hitler's master plan. Today we are at home, locked down, praying for our loved ones who are suffering from the virus, praying that we don't catch it ourselves and mourning those we have lost. Many whom I've spoken to, my age or younger, 
have expressed how difficult these past few weeks have been. Schools are closed. Stores are closed. Restaurants, theaters, even most parks are closed. They feel trapped, imprisoned by this most horrible disease. It is perhaps the worst experience of their lives. I've also had the privilege of speaking with a few Holocaust survivors, including my dear mother, Gladys Halpern. They also are captives of the coronavirus. But they who slept in the sewers or under the floorboards of a barn, they who ran through the forests hunted by Nazis with machine guns and barking dogs, they who were worked to death in the concentration camps, or like my mother who shivered in the attic of a righteous Polish savior without food or drink, only the survivors know what captivity truly is. If we were standing together today in Auschwitz, we would be, we would be lighting memorial candles and reciting Kaddish for the six million Kedoshim. We would have seen the gate that the Jews passed through as they entered the camp. The infamous slogan above that gate sadistically proclaims, Arbeit macht frei, work will set you free. It is ironic that work did in fact set us free. Not the work of tending the crematoria that the doomed Jewish prisoners were forced to do before their ashes went up the chimneys, but the work of pioneers draining the swamps, plowing the fields, establishing the kibbutzim, and building the cities that would form the foundation of the Jewish state. 100 years ago, 1920, the year my dear father, Sam Halpern, Zechrona Livracha, was born, his family and the other Jews of Eastern Europe struggled in their shtetls to make a meager living. They were stateless, powerless, and in many cases, penniless. But they still had their Torah, and they still had their traditions, and they still had the hope, Hatikva, that they would someday reach Eretz Yisrael. They could not imagine the horrors that would visit them just two decades later. And they certainly, even in their wildest dreams, could not foresee a thriving Jewish state of Israel in its 73rd year of independence, a year in which we commemorate the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, at a time in which we celebrate the miracles that over the years Israel has absorbed millions of Jews from all over the world, that today Israel is a leader in medical innovation, in technology, and in so many fields benefiting all of humanity. And that today, the most sophisticated business people in the world look to Israel as an ideal investment opportunity. Except for only a precious few, we did not have to suffer in the camps, and we did not have to fight in Israel's war of independence. But as we were commanded on Passover, we have to feel as if we were there. We have to feel the pain of the Jews suffering in the Holocaust. And we have to feel the sacrifice of the Israeli soldiers and feel their ultimate joy when Israel was victorious. Today on Yom HaShoah, just a few weeks from Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzma'ut, there is much to remember. Let us remember. Thank you, David, for those beautiful remarks. I would now ask Alan Pines, our, uh, a national board member, to lead the candle lighting and Yisker prayer. Thank you, Bill. I would ask everyone to please join me in lighting their Yisker candle right now.
<clears throat> Would everyone please rise? Yizkar Elohim, Nishmat Hakidoshim Vatehorim, Shaham Tu, Vishen Hergu, Vishenit Hatu, Vishenit Rafu, Vishenit Bu, Vishenihanku, Akidush Hashem. Bavur, Shainachnu mit Palolim, Bad Haskarat, Vishmotehem. Vishazer, Iyena, Nafshotehem, Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, Belea, Bim Sha'ar, Sadikim, Visit Konyo, Shibagan Eden, and Omar. Amen. Amen. <laughs> May God remember the holy and pure souls of those that were killed, murdered, slaughtered, burned, drowned, or strangled for the sanctification of God's name. For we pray in remembrance of their souls. May their souls be bound in the bond of everlasting life together with the souls of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, and all the other righteous men and women in the Garden of Eden, and let us say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Alan. Please remain standing, ladies and gentlemen, while I call upon Rabbi E. Samuel Klibanoff, spiritual leader of Congregation Etz Chaim in Livingston, New Jersey, and chairman of the Israel Bonds Rabbinic Advisory Council. Lead us in the Almali Rachamim prayer. Please stand if you're not. <laughs> Shochein v'amiromi Hametzei Minechon echono Akanti ha'chechino V'ma'alos Kidoshim et tehorim K'zawar orakia masirim Es nishmos Hakidoshim v'hatehorim Shehumesu v'shenergu v'shenishchatu v'shenisrefu v'shenetpiyo v'shenechneku al-kidush Hashem Al Yidei Hatzarim Hagermani Mimach Shimon V'Zichron Bahavor Shanachnu Mispalalim Bar Haskaras Nishim Oseyem Begahan Eidet Daimon Uchasam Bochein Baal Rachamim Yastirim Vesei Sikhan Afaham Liyolamim Bitzror, bitzror ha'chayim es nishma seyhem Adonai unach alasam V'yanuchu v'shalom ha'mishkiva seyhem V'nomar Amen Amen Please be seated, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Rabbi. We are now privileged to hear a special recorded message from Rabbi Yisrael Meyer Lau. Rabbi Lau is one of Israel's most revered public figures, both as a spiritual leader and scholar. He survived Buchenwald as a small child, and throughout the decades, he has been a leading advocate for remembrance. Please listen to his moving words. Dear friends of the Bonds, dear friends and colleagues and supporters and donors, and good friends that I used to meet as part of them every year here in the day of Yom Ma'ud in the Hilton Hotel in Tel Aviv. Unfortunately, if the virus, the corona, doesn't enable us to meet, doesn't enable you to come here to be with us on Yom HaShoah 
for the Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Let's talk of this way in the great hope next year will be everything okay and all of you will be in good health, good life. I want to tell you, there is a debate between historians already, last 75 years, if, if it wouldn't be in the Holocaust, would the state of Israel be declared as a Jewish independent state as it happened or not? Is there a connection between the Holocaust and redemption? Yes or not? From one side, everyone says, look, all the states, let's, let's say, say in Africa, dozens of states, they received their independence from the great empires at the time of England and France, even Holland and Belgium. They were all dominions of the states in Europe, and they became independent. Why not uh, the people of Israel? Don't they deserve the same like all the others? So this is one thing. But on the other hand, in the history of 4,000 years, the long history of the Jewish people, only two and a half years between May 45, the end of World War II, to November 47, the decision of the United States in late success to establish a Jewish state in a part of the historic Eretz Israel in the Middle East. Don't we deserve the same from one side? But on the other side, it didn't happen 2,000 years. And it happened two and a half years after the Holocaust. Must be some connection between these two. The sympathy after the Holocaust, the empathy to the Jewish people, brought the 33 members of the UN that time to vote pro for the Jewish dependent state here. So must be a connection, especially at the days of the independence. We opened the gates, not of in Lid, in Ben Gurion Airport, which didn't exist for us, but Haifa Port and Jaffa Port, Tel Aviv, and we opened a lot Port, wasn't exist, for newcomers, for Olim. They were not spelled back to Europe or to Cyprus or to Mauritius. As the others, they came openly free and they became the first citizens of the Jewish state. So must be a connection between the two. I myself can be a witness. I was already in Israel at the time. I arrived just after the war from Buchenwald to Eretz Israel. As a child, I came here and I remember the dozens of thousands who arrived straight after the independence came to Israel to be citizens. But it's not enough to decide upon an independent state. You have to keep it. You have to build it. The bonds helped us, helped us a lot to build the state, to build and to develop agriculture, science, medicine, universities, all kinds of the absorption of all the commons. Without the help of the bonds, your help, I don't know if you would uh, overcome all the wars that we had to fight here seven wars in two generations. Seven wars. First of all, the independence war, which took a year and a half. And we lost that time 6,000 sons and girls and daughters. 6,000 from a population of 600,000 at all. And then the Kadesh, the Gulf, and then the Six Days War, and then Yom Kippur War, the October War of 73, and then the Gulf War, 91. We made it. We made it in days after the Independence War, when the IDF was established. Svaha Ganali Israel Sahal. In days, we overcame two or three Arab countries at the same time. Three, the Six Days War, Two, Egypt and Syria, the Yom Kippur War, in 18 days or in 6 days. What empire did it in 18 days? You remember yourself at America, 
וייטנאם, לאוס, קמבודיה, אפגניסטן, אין עיראק, רוס אוף יירס, רוס אוף דייס, וישראל עשו את זה, ואנחנו היינו מינוריטי, ואנחנו לא היינו אפילו אין אירפורס, כשדוד בן גוריון נקרא את המדינה של המדינה או מאי 1948, We didn't have an Air Force, but we did it. We didn't do, do it alone, only with the help and the support and the solidarity with the Jews in a diaspora, you. But then later on, the bonds was established and helped us to develop all the beautiful items that the State of Israel is so proud of them. that I mentioned before. I wish you, first of all, in this time, this period, good health and long life and peace. Peace for us and solidarity. You are the symbol of the solidarity because you are the bridge between Jews in Israel and Jews in diaspora. To keep this bridge, iron, very, very strong, to give hands one to the other, to offer a shoulder one to the other, and together to come here, as we said in the Haggadah Shel Pesach last week, Meshana Haba'ah, Yerushalayim Abluyah. Thank you for what you are. Thank you for what you will be for generations to come. Thanks at all. Amen. I now call upon Susan Weikers, treasurer of our international board, who will make brief remarks and also introduce Dr. Gita Sikowitz. Thank you, Bill. <clears throat> I would be remiss if I didn't start by saying that listening to David Halpern discuss what Holocaust survivors went through is so poignant for what we hear today about Corona and being stuck in our home. Yes, we are at home, but we're safe. And God willing, we will stay well, we will stay strong. I was asked to give some reflections about the Holocaust in reference to myself. And I must start with an Israel bond mission that I participated in in 1975. It was a new leadership mission. And the first speaker was the late Yehuda Avner. And he looked out on this vast group of young people. And he said, how many of you were born between 1940 and 1945? And tons of hands went up. We were so proud. We were there. We were young. He said, well, my dear friends, Let me tell you about your responsibility. There were a million children murdered in the Holocaust. Your generation of Jews who would grow up in Europe do not exist. And therefore, your responsibility is not only for yourself. Your responsibility is is to do more for the Jewish people because you are doing it for you, for your family, and for a child who either perished or were never born. It was so significant to hear him say that. And I recall that on my very first visit to Yad Vashem, the impact of that small glass case with one child's shoe in it. And above that case, it said one million. One million children. And here I was, one of the lucky ones. My dad, of blessed memories, family, left Germany. My dad married an American woman. And I... I was given the gift of life. Well, when you see that you are lucky, you realize that you have to remember every day. 
And about 30 years ago, I spoke for a group in Los Angeles, and the Bellsberg family gave me a gift. I want to share that with you. This Jewish star framed sits on my entrance hall table. It is the first thing I see when I open the door. I know what this star meant, and I know today what it means to me. It said that memory, memory is the scribe for the soul. I believe that. I believe if we remember, it's written on our soul. Holocaust survivors bear witness to the horror. And our generation, our generation are the privileged to hear from the witnesses. Many of you are the next generation. And your task is to become the witnesses of the witnesses. That's our privilege. That's our responsibility. The living owe it to those who can no longer speak to tell the story. That is what witnesses do. So please accept your role for all of us. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once said, a Jewish story may start with tears, but it ends with hope. Think about the Passover Seder, which even in these challenging times, we as Jews found a way to celebrate and commemorate. A Seder begins with a bread of affliction, tears, and ends with freedom, hope, that is who we are as Jews. For us to have dear Gita Sikowitz with us today explains tears and hope perfectly. Gita grew up in Czechoslovakia to a pious family. She suffered through the Holocaust, Auschwitz, Birkenau, she immigrated to the United States, and then ultimately, she made Aliyah. Gita is still helping people today, and it is indeed my honor to turn this program over to dear Gita Sikowitz. Gita, please join us. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your words. You moved me very deeply. Thank you for your words. Uh, yes, I, uh, I am one of the Hungarian Jews, or at the time I was, it was Hungary that deported us to Auschwitz and uh, to Birkenau and then to labor camp. And um, I cannot talk about that now, but I want to tell you, I only have time to tell you about of one episode, one vignette of my stay in the labor camp, which came after uh, Birkenau. I was in Birkenau for five months, and we had to get out of there because we couldn't stand the fact that my mother was with us, and every second of her stay with us in, in Birkenau was a real threat to her life because she was 47 years old in a group of 15 or 13 to 32 year old people and she stood out very clearly as a 47 year old person and every day that she wasn't selected by the Nazis to the to the gas chambers was a miracle. So we had to get out and we got out to labor camp, which was in a town called Mittelsteine, in a factory that uh, produced uh, 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 
Sergei Hilov's uh, spare parts to aeroplanes. We worked on metal, all kinds of metal, and we had the most difficult conditions you can imagine. I don't want to elaborate, but let me tell you one example of how this demonstrated itself. We suffer terribly from hunger, and that you hear from everybody. It doesn't have to repeat. And we lived on 200 grams of bread and a little margarine a day. And the soup, which was not really soup, it was water in which some weeds were cooked. So at first there was the terrible, terrible hunger. To the point where in the end we went to the kitchen garbage to find potato peels and that's what we ate. To feel a little bit full sometimes. But uh, the other thing that we suffered from an awful lot was cold. Unbearable cold. Because if we were woken up before five o'clock to stand, to stand tail appel or roll call at five o'clock in the morning and to collect our bread, our 200, 200 grams of bread a day. And then go for an hour to work through fields, in snow, in sleet, in rain, without proper shoes. Not without proper shoes, that's an understatement. With shoes that were fall, falling apart, without underwear, only in a, in a little dress and a little nothing coat. No stockings, no handkerchiefs, no, no gloves, no hat, nothing to protect us from the cold. And in the block, in the barrack, icicles were coming down from the sky, from the ceiling. And we did this every day, an hour walk, an hour walk to work in the snow, as I said, and in 12 hours of work, hard work, and an hour back after 14 hours being away. And one time this episode happened, this thing happened. It was a Sunday when we didn't work, and we were uh, sitting in the barrack. There was a bench, and we were young girls, young women, and we were schmoozing, sitting in our blankets. We had a little nothing blanket, but we put it on ourselves, we tied it on ourselves, and uh, and uh, uh, and we were schmoozing, we were talking. And suddenly an SS comes into our barrack. The SS woman was, uh, had the duty that day to, to watch the barracks. And she comes in and we stop talking, of course. And she looks around and she says, why is it so cold here? And we were smiling. Nobody answered her. We were smiling. Doesn't she know? She has to ask us. Outside our barrack, there is a mount of, there is a mount of coals. Inside, there's a lovely little cast iron stove waiting to to have some fire in it, lit in it. But no, it was cold. So she started howling. Why don't you answer me? He didn't answer. Why don't you answer me? I talk to you and you have to answer me. So why is it so cold here? So somebody answered her. 
we were not permitted to light the fire. But this is a lie, this is not true anyway, because when we took our first shower and we were stripped of all our hair and we looked ridiculously ugly, and then we were let go with a dress they threw at us, some dress that came from the people who came on transport and without toilet paper the whole year nothing that replaced toilet paper nothing no toilet paper no toothbrush no nothing hygienic nothing we had dysenteries we were dirty there was nothing like paper like toilet paper for the whole year. I don't know how we managed, don't ask. But certainly they didn't give us anything to, to be dressed for the Polish winter. And so, so she said, who says that you, you're not permitted? Who said it? She shrugged out her shoulders. She says, so she said, why not make a fire? She said, so we asked, somebody there asked her, uh, so can we make a fire? And she said, why not? And then she ordered the girls to bring in some coal and she made a fire. And it was really a machaya to, to smell the smell of warmth in the evening, wonderful. And the fire went out, and in the morning at five o'clock, we are lined up in the field for roll call and for getting the bread in preparation of going to work. And then it's announced that our barrack is not getting it's part, it's bread portion today. Because the woman SS uh, squealed on us, said that we made the fire. And therefore, from yesterday morning, 24 hours ago, when we ate our or bread of yesterday, until tomorrow morning, we are on full fast. And when we were announced this, I looked around, because sort of, I feel today as if I would oversee the kids. I was 17 years old, and I thought that this certainly will, br will bring on some kind of rebellion because this is impossible that when we fast, actually fast the whole year because our portion of bread was like fasting portions. But now for two days straight, we have to go on with our work, with our duties, without anything to eat. And we were marching to work. I looked around, I looked at the kids at, and my colleagues. They were barely dressed. It was a terribly cold morning. And we start walking and I said, I was waiting for someone to start rebelling actually. Nobody said a word. We just marched the hour to work worked there 12 hours standing up if we had a machine that required standing up without a bite of food because we usually ate our bread immediately when we got it to feel full once a day at least and <clears throat> we finished and went home i cannot today understand how we
and we survived. We survived, all of us, all the 200 girls survived. Thank God. With fasting like that. You know, I, a year ago, I was at the Zikaromba Salon. You know, I was talking to people about the Shoah. And the host was a biologist. And he, said, he had one question. How could you survive without an iota of protein in the whole year? Nothing in the whole year. Anyway, this is my story. Thank you very much for listening. We are alive. I am in Israel. I came from America where I lived for 44 years. I want to tell you something else about myself. I am a doctor. I have a PhD in psychology. I was kicked out of school at age 12 by the Hungarians who occupied the part of the of, of, uh, world where I lived in Czechoslovakia. And at age 12, when the, when the uh, Hungarians occupied us and they, we returned to school, the teacher told us, the Jewish kids who, come, who were part of the class to get out through that door over there, Jewish children will not be taught anymore in Hungarian schools. And from that then on to 30 years later, through the Auschwitz and the labor camp and the harassment and the humiliation, and, and the Unmenschlichkeit, nobody looked us into our faces as if we are nothing. And 30 years later, when I, after I came to America and started a life to make for ourselves a Jewish life, a white tablecloth on a Shabbat table with candles, that was important. And I had three children, and the little one was three years old, my son. And I took him to a cheder in Borough Park. I went straight to Brooklyn College, where they accepted me to the college. I went through a bachelor's degree, and there was a program, a BA, PhD program. And I entered it, and I finished, thank God with a PhD in psychology. And in Israel here, I've been here 28 years, working all along for AMCHA. This is the organization that provides psychological help for Holocaust survivors. Let me tell you, Israel and AMCHA, and working with Holocaust survivors liberated me and made it possible to have a goal forever. I think I am now 93 years old, but I believe that till I die, I will feel that I have things to accomplish. I have things to do, especially delivering messages to Holocaust survivors, to, to those who are willing to listen to me, to the message to stand up and to continue being to the Israeli, to all the Jewish people, to be what they are, but to dedicate their lives or part of their lives to continue our heritage. Israel is the best place in the world. There's so many, there's so many good people always willing to help, always running after me. Oh, I forgot to offer you. Can I carry something for you? I mean, this didn't happen ever before. 
and I was very impressed with the people who spoke before me here, and they really spoke wonderfully. And thank you, and thank you for listening to me. Bye. Rita, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your inspirational and inspiring words and stories and experiences. No one can ever imagine what the Holocaust was like. But when we hear it from someone who participated, like yourself, it really brings home the truth of man's inhumanity to man. So thank you, thank you again for sharing your stories with us. Now I'd like to call upon Glenn Siegel, who will lead us. Uh, Glenn is a national board member, and he will lead us in saying Kaddish. Please join me in reciting Kaddish. Yiskadal, Yiskadal, Shemei Rabal. Bialma Dibrak, Hirusei, Yamali Khansei, Bechayakon, Umechon, Bufchaye, the Hulk Beit Israel, Bagolom, Uzman Karim, Bimaru, Amen. Yehesh me rabo mavorah le alom o me o mayo. Yis borah, be yis tabak, be yis bar, be yis mama, be yis nase, be yis hadar, be yis halal, be yis halal, she made a kodisho, rehu. Le alom mean ko birkoso, she rosso, tush bikoso, the nekamoso, damiran, be alma, be maru, o me. Yehesh lomo rabo mean shamayo. I now would call upon our chairman of the board, Howard Rubenstein, for some concluding remarks. Howard? Yes, it's Howard Goldstein. Uh, I just want to give a couple of comments. Uh, on the emotional impact that I think we all had today. A couple of words that come to my mind. One is love, overwhelmed, a heavy heart, pride, verklempt, and certainly an inordinate sense of responsibility. I'd like to thank the remarkable statements by Rabbi Lau and Gila Sikowitz. They are embedded in my heart forever. Uh, the extraordinary effect that the Bonds leadership from throughout the world today joined together to commemorate the Holocaust. And I also would be remiss if I didn't thank Israel and Zev and his incredible business development team that really put all this together in a short period of time. You know, although the pandemic canceled our trip to the march, which we were supposed to be there, Almost this exact time uh, today in Poland, uh, Israel and I pledge that as soon as the suspension and shutdown is over, Israel Bonds will take a solidarity mission uh, and support our beloved Israel and go over there as soon as possible. And of course, we will always, always, always participate in the March of the Living. Uh, the, this has been a rather gratifying and powerful experience to share this ceremony with all our Ban Mishpucha who are on the line today. This event has clearly demonstrated that we're truly one extended family and one of incredible passion for Israel, our people, and unwavering responsibility to never, ever, ever forget this day uh going forward for hopefully our lifetime i'm israel Chai. i now turn this back to our uh, moderator bill fox thank you howard thank you ladies and gentlemen i was going to close today's meeting with the same words that howard just used i'm israel Chai. the jewish people lives however i'd like everyone on this call to join me let's together with our heads held high, say loudly and proudly and with one voice, we are here, Am Yisroel Chai, 
the Jewish people lives forever. Join me now at the count of three. One, two, three. Us today for this remarkable ceremony. Be safe and be well. Thank you.